many of you have been following this past week the media coverage uh, surrounding the death and burial of Queen Elizabeth II? Anybody? A lot of you have. She was the queen of the United Kingdom. Uh, as most of you likely know, Queen Elizabeth ruled on her throne for 70 years, 214 days, the longest of uh, any British monarch. And now with her death, her son Charles uh, has been appointed king to take her place. You know, it's hard to predetermine what kind of a king uh, Charles uh, will be. Only time will answer that question. But one would, one would think, and we would certainly hope, that King Charles will rule with the same uh, sort of dignity and class that his, his mother was known for. You know, as a church family, uh, for the last 19 weeks, we have been working our way through the book of, of Proverbs, which, as you largely and likely know, was largely written by another king, King Solomon, who was the king uh, or the son of, of King David. King Solomon, uh, you'll remember, uh, well, you'll remember that King David, if you know David's story, he's widely known as first starting out as a shepherd boy, right, that defeated the giant Goliath. But David, when you, even to this day, if you go to Israel, was a king and is a king who was highly respected, much like Queen Elizabeth. And so the Bible, you know, describes King David as a man after God's own heart. And King Solomon, early on into his, his ministry, before he got his thousand wives and however many concubines he had, he began to kind of stray a little bit as a result of the, the influence of all these women and their, you know, pursuit of secular religion. But in the, in the early parts of his days, he really followed his dad's footsteps. And in today's conversation, as we delve into this idea of wisdom to live by, I want to invite you to ponder four enemies that King Solomon warns us as followers of Jesus to be on guard against. Four enemies that will ruin your life if you're not careful. And the first enemy is this. If you're taking notes in our Palm Harvest app, write this down. And that is the enemy of alcohol. Alcohol, Solomon says, impairs. Alcohol, when overabundantly ingested, will negatively influence your judgment and decision making. Look at what he says in verse 1. Proverbs 20, verse 1. He says, wine produces mockers, lead, liquor leads to brawls. Whoever is led astray by drink cannot be wise. Now, church, have you ever witnessed the truth of this Bible verse either in your own life or in the life of somebody else? You know, have you ever witnessed how drunkenness does not lead to good decision-making? Would you agree? Look at, in fact, if you have a Bible, skip to chapter 23. I want you to go a couple chapters forward, and I want you to look at what Solomon writes in verses 29 to 35. Chapter 23 Verses 29 to 35. This is what he writes. He begins by asking these questions. He says, who has anguish? Who has sorrow? Who is always fighting? Who is always complaining? Who has unnecessary bruises? Who has bloodshot eyes? And then he answers this question. He says, it's the one who spends long hours in the taverns trying out new drinks. Who doesn't like to try out new drinks, right? Right? He says, don't let the sparkle and smooth taste of wine deceive you. For in the end, it bites like a poisonous serpent. It stings like a viper. You will see hallucinations and you will say crazy things. You will stagger like a sailor tossed at sea, clinging to a swaying mast. And you will say, they hit me, but I don't feel it. I don't even know it when they beat me up. When will I wake up so I can have another drink? Friends, there's a reason the motto, don't drink and drive, exists. What's the reason? It's because alcohol impairs. Now, hear me clearly on this, okay? Hear me very clearly. The Bible does not teach that drinking alcohol is a sin. You got me? Let me see some head nods. The Bible does not teach that enjoying a glass of Chardonnay or some other spirit is a no-no. Everybody nod their head. Are you with me? Okay. But it counsels us to avoid drunkenness. And so if you want to be wise, 
If you want to live a life that is colored with wise decisions, then Solomon advises us, the Bible advises us to moderate your intake of alcohol. Because according to these Bible verses, alcohol does what? Alcohol impairs. Point number two. A second enemy that King Solomon here in the Bible warns us to be cautious of, which is just as dangerous, is the enemy of bickering. Because bickering drains. Bickering drains. Verse 3, Proverbs chapter 20, verse 3, he says, Avoiding a fight is a mark of honor. Only fools insist on quarreling. If you go to the next chapter, 21, verse 9, this is a good one. It says, it's better to live alone on the corner of the attic or on the corner of the housetop than to share a house with a contentious, brawling, bitter-tongued wife in a lovely home. Why? Because bickering drains. You ever known a bickerer? Anybody have the spiritual gift of bickering in the house here? You know, would the people in your relational circles describe you as someone who bickers? As someone who nitpicks and sees the flaws in stuff? Or is it natural for you to focus on that which is good? You know, this past Wednesday, we had our back to school uh, dinner that Palm Harvest hosted. Uh, Kirk reached out to me and, and he said, hey, Mike, can you help us? And we said, yeah, we'll help them. So we served all these people. Uh, Nancy Kapko, who was there, thought maybe we served about 100 people or so. Uh, I didn't count. I never really do. But afterwards, Rick and Nancy and I, it was such a nice night that they had at the Back Bay High School, they had this kind of this picnic area. And we just sat at the picnic table uh, eating cookies because we had some extra cookies for like two hours just sitting around the table and, and just talking and, and enjoying, you know, the conversation. It was a beautiful night. You know, the, the geese were flying overhead. They were kind of, you know, I guess going to wherever they go down the Back Bay Reserve. And you see that right now at this time of the year. I don't know what it is, but they, they have these flight patterns. And it's just, you hear them squawking, encouragement and whatnot. And at, at one point in our conversation, Nancy turns and she looks up at the sky and she goes, Oh, what a beautiful sunset, right? What a beautiful sunset. To which I respond, I look up and I go, well, that's not, that's not really that special. So there's no color, it's just kind of gray. And she goes, no, don't you think that's, those are kind of like the clouds that'll look like when Jesus comes back, you know, in the clouds. And I'm going, I don't know, Nancy. And, and I'm, I was being a little, I was trying to be funny, and then as the night conversation kept going and then the color started to come into the sky, I'd go, oh, now that's a beautiful sunset, you know. And after about the fourth time I said that, Rick, who was sitting across the table, said to me, Mike, you're not winning any points right now because I could just see Nancy's mood. Her whole mood was deflating, reinforcing this truth that what? Bickering, it drains. You know, later in the conversation as I was reflecting on my bickering, and I could see visually the impact it was having on her emotionally, even though I was joking. I said to her, you know, Nancy, if I wake up tomorrow morning and I'm blind, unable to see, I'm going to be grateful to you for pointing out the sunset because that'll be the last sunset that I ever see. Right? Friends, do you have a tendency to see that what in what could be better in stuff? Or do you have the ability to look at things as they are and be grateful? Church, don't be a bickerer. Rather, choose with God's help. Choose to celebrate and see the good in things. Why? Because it is an enemy and bickering does what? It drains. So let's say a prayer. I need to say a prayer on this one. And maybe you do too. Okay? Hands open. Heart open, mind open. Let's ask God right now in this moment to be people who speak words of encouragement, who speak words of life, not words of nitpickness, okay? So hands open, here we go. Let's pray this. Just say, Heavenly Father, please forgive me when I complain and find fault. Please help me to see the good in people. Please help me to see the good in your creation. 
because Lord, I don't want to be a, fill in the blank, bickerer. Good, sweet, amen. Let's move on, point number three. A third enemy that Solomon warns you and me to be on guard against here in Proverbs chapter 20, which David alluded to in his, our conversation here earlier, is the enemy called independence. Independence, because independence handicapped. You'll remember David said independence. These kids are living in isolation, and isolation out of COVID has led to anxiety. You remember him saying that? Independence, isolation. We talk about this all the time, how isolation and independence is a weapon of the devil. Look at what Solomon writes in verse 18. He says, plan succeed through good counsel. Don't go to war without wise advice. You know, we talk about this truth all the time around here at Palm Harvest Church, how I need you and you need me, and that's how God designed us, yes, from the very beginning of creation. If we go all the way back to the first book of the Bible in the book of Genesis, we can read in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, how God, after creating all the plants and animals and he creates man, he looks at Adam and he says, it's not good for man to be what? Alone. So it's not good for man to be alone. He says, God says, I will create a helper for him. I will create a helpmate to live life with him. And so God created Eve. You know, brothers and sisters, from the very beginning of humanity, God's design for you and me to live is to live in community. So again, well done for being here today. Now, show of hands, how many of you, and maybe today was the day when you said, I don't really want to go to church today. I'd rather stay home, right? You ever felt that? Or am I the only one? Well, you got to go, Mike, because you're the pastor, right? There are times when I don't even want to go, you know, wherever... But when I go, inevitably, I come away feeling refreshed and going, oh, man, I really made that decision. But here's the deal, brothers and sisters. You don't go to church or involve yourself in a church community like this just for yourself. You do it for all of us. Because when I come into this auditorium and you give me that hug or you give me that smile or you say, how is your day or this week? It brings cheer and life to me. And I would imagine the same happens to you when other people do the same. Why? Because God created us to live in community. Independence handicaps. You know, when we read and study the life of Jesus and the occupation of his first disciples, we'll, we'll read how there's all kinds of different occupations who made up of his early followers. There's fishermen, obviously. There's tax collectors. There's all kinds of entrepreneurs. When you read about the beginning of the early church, we see businessmen and businesswomen who simply made money to, to help resource the ministry of this early gospel sharing. If you fast forward to the book of Romans, which was a church, a letter that was written to the church in Rome, or if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Romans 12, or 1 Corinthians 12 with church in Corinth, you will read how the apostle Paul lists all these different kind of gifts and abilities, right? He says there's teachers, and there's, there's you know, helpers, and there's the gift of administration, and there's a gift of leadership. And basically what he is saying is not one person can do everything. Why? Because we all have blind spots. And King Solomon advises us here about the importance of soliciting input from others when making decisions because independence handicaps. An independent, self-sustaining attitude will lead to ruin. You know, as we were sitting around this picnic table at, on the Back Bay High School talking with Rick, as I was talking with Rick and Nancy, I asked Rick the question. I said, Rick, you know, you're, you're in the wo world of finances, right? That's what he does. Rick's a, a trustee here on our church board. He helps us and Lisa, you know, deal with the management of, of the gifts and the ties and stuff that are given uh, to, to to this organization, they make decisions. Like, for example, they just, our board just created this new fund that people can give to from the community that Kirk now will use to sponsor educational needs at Back Bay High School. We've, we've created similar funds like that in the, in the past. But I asked Rick, I said, Rick, when you're making a financial decision, who do you turn to for advice? I know you're smart. You might be the smartest guy in the room, but who do you turn to? And he said, well, it depends. I said, well, it depends on what? He said, it depends on what decision I'm trying to make. 
He said some friends have insight into one area and then other friends have an insight into other areas. Are you with me? He said, I don't always go to just one person. I, I spread it around. And what Kirk has, or I mean, what, what Rick is, is reminding us of is the importance of collaboration. You know, as Kirk reached out to me, and you guys know this because I've been talking about it for two weeks or three weeks, when he reached out to me, which is totally non-independent, said, hey, Mike, can, you, can Palm Harvest put on this back bay you know, picnic, if you will, for the students and, and the teachers? First person I called, two people. I sent out a text. It was a group text to, to Millie Gudino, who I've worked with on many occasions, and Robin Mensinger, who I've only heard about, really, how amazing she is as an organizer. And I said, you ladies, I really need your help with this. Can you, you know, really carry the load, so to speak? Because I don't want to be independent, and I'm not really that good with, with food, whatever, you know. And they said, sure, we'll help you. Well, as, a, as we got closer, like a week away from the event, Robin Mensinger sent out this email to all these people who were involved. And I was like, my mind went, Pfft. I called Steve this week, and I said, your wife is amazing. Her leadership capacity blew my mind. And, and, but Robin didn't do it all on her own. We showed up on Wednesday. Some people brought food. Some people, we had a line of people. The Perrys were there. Elizabeth right away said, hey, are we going to pray? You know, thank you, Elizabeth, right? So we had all these different people serving, and there was music and stuff. And you know what I was doing? I was goofing around because that's my gift. I have the spiritual gift of goofing around. I was talking to the teachers, I was in the gymnasium talking to different people. And every time I came out, people were going through the line, getting a drink, and people were serving, reminding me how wonderful it is when we all work together. Would you agree with that? We all can't be good at everything, brothers and sisters. And Solomon reminds us here that independence, right, it, it handicaps your role matters. Your contribution has value. In fact, turn to your neighbor and say, you matter. You matter. You know, a good question, I'm gonna, I gotta move on because we're already out of time. But here's a good question to ask. What aren't I seeing? What aren't I seeing? Friends, don't go through life solo, independence handicaps. Finally, a fourth enemy that King Solomon advises us to be on guard against because it too will ruin our life. It's the enemy of control. The enemy of control. Control clogs. Verse 24. The Lord directs our steps, so why try to understand everything along the way? Show of hands. How many of you need to be in control? You know, good. How many of you need to have the last word on everything? Here's something for you to, a question for you to ponder. How hard is it for you to trust people with the stuff that matters to you, right? You know, years ago when I came, graduated from seminary, I prayed the Lord would lead me to a church where I had a good mentoring pastor that would give me lots of space to, and rope to hang myself, so to speak. Like just, he would give me, encourage me to take risks and, and to, you know, to go out. And fortunately, the Lord answered that prayer. And then when Palm Harvest Church started, I was really controlling. I wanted to control what kind of church we were going to be, you know, and, and who we were going to be and who we weren't going to want to be. I was really insistent about the culture. I wanted us to be a church that rolled up our sleeves and served people. And after a while, though, you know what started happening? We start bogging down because I became a bottleneck, because I had to control everything. And I found myself stifling people's creativity. And, and, and I was not really giving them the same latitude that my former pastor had given to me. And I learned firsthand about this enemy that King Solomon warns us of, that control clogs. And as I mentioned already, the thing I, I think I enjoyed so much about this back bay dinner is because I wasn't running it. We were all running it together. We were a team. Some of you weren't even there, but you know what? You were a part of it. Some of you gave your money to help buy the food and the stuff that we used to serve. Some of you prayed. It just reminded me again, so full, full blown, is that we need each other. 
And so church, in closing, when it comes to life, you do you. But let other people do them too. And to recognize that you are not in control. You know that, right? Turn to your neighbor and say, you're not in control. You're not in control, but who is? God is. And he invites you to trust him. So where God, where's God inviting you to trust him? In your marriage? With your finances? With your kids' discipline issues? With your job pressures? With your health? Three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I asked you to pray for Rob Friedman. Remember that? We prayed for Rob. He was going into court. He was a defendant. He was two weeks on the stand. And now the judge, the decision is in the judge's hands. Now, we hope the decision goes our way, but ultimately, who's in control? God. So we wait. We pray for Jerry Geislin. Jerry was going to have heart surgery. She went in. The procedure went well. She's home. She's recovering. It's going the way that we had hoped it would Reminding us yet again that God's in control. We put our trust in God. But I also remember, if you'll remember, I asked you to pray for Lisa, Lisa Jolliffe. Four weeks ago, Lisa got in the shower. She noticed some bruises on her legs. She goes, ah, that's a little kind of weird. Goes to the doctor. They said, we think you should go to the hospital. They send her to the hospital and they, they do some tests. And they, think, they said, we think we, you have leukemia, but we're not sure. So we're going to send the blood to Seattle. We're going to send it to Mayo Clinic in Minnesota. And we're going to see what they have to say. And so we, they waited. One week goes by, still no answers. Two weeks go by, still no answers. Her health is declining. Two and a half, three weeks go by, they get the results. This last week. And the results they got is not what they wanted to hear. They said, at least that you have four sta stage four cancer and you have an incurable kind of disease. She said, am I going to make it till Christmas? They said, we can't. We're not sure. So the next day they tried doing chemo. She started bleeding internally. And they said, she said, we're going home. We're going to go home on hospice. Four weeks ago. And right now she's breathing really hard. And barring a miracle, she's not going to make it. I will be the first to tell you that I don't always understand why God does, does what he does. But it doesn't remove from me the truth and the hope and the belief that God is in control. Do you believe that? Will you trust God with your stuff? Why does God allow some things to happen? I don't know. But what I do know is loose grip living, open hand living is the foundation of a wise and healthy life. And that's what Solomon is reminding us here because control clogs. So friends, in closing, let me just say this. I want to remind you again that at the very foundation of everything, every breath that you breathe, God loves you and he is for you and he is with you even when things don't always go the way that you or I want. He's with you in the highs and the lows. He's with you and me in the ups and the downs. And that's why God sent his, his son, Jesus, to come, to be our source of intermediator relationship because he wants to have a relationship with us. Because, brothers and sisters, of these four enemies, alcohol, overabundance is bad, bickering certainly drains, and independence is a killer. But the biggest enemy of all is control. A heart that says, I got this, I want to call the shots. And God's just saying, will you let me carry your stuff? Will you let me be in relationship with you? And so would you just bow your head for a second and let me just invite you to answer this question. Will you today, again, allow God to lead in your life? Will you ask Jesus, if you haven't yet, to take control of your stuff? Will you say, Jesus, take my heart Take my ambitions. Take my kids and those things that mean so much to me. Take my every breath. Jesus, I give you my heart today because I recognize I'm not in control and I want to trust you. Today, Jesus, I give you me Good. Amen. 
Brothers and sisters, four enemies that will ruin your life. The enemy of alcohol, bickering, just as bad, independence, and control. But these are enemies that with God's help, you and I can defeat, amen? And this is biblical wisdom to live by.